in the second edition of my book. A lot of these things are not in there. That's the theme. Something new. Or something more clearly defined. Or some name change or something that has altered since, let's say, the last book. But in recent years. So go ahead now. So we have a 49-year-old male with a right thyroid blood lesion. Okay. So, we can focus this. Are we part focal or not? Yeah, I'm in focus. Huh? Yeah, I'm in focus. Okay, so what do you see? So on the power you can see a normal virus trying to come out in the country. Who's on frozen? Who's on frozen? In, 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 yeah, because uh, Mark Rookin has a frozen. Which I think was there. You have his number? Okay, if you guys can call him, because I tried calling her back again. Yeah. So maybe Alex is here right now. But you know, I'm mean, going to start in the conference with the residents and Rosa. So if you can have Gabe call Alex to make sure he gets there or there or there. Now just send me an email letting me know what went on. All right, thank you. So what do you got? So I see a healthy market model. Does it make a difference if it's encapsulated or, or not? Why? If it's encapsulated, you're not going to be encapsulated. So if it's, if it's, is that encapsulated? You said circumscribed. I'm trying to get to a point. It's, it's, it's encapsulated? Yeah. You sure you see a capsule around it? No, I don't think it's, well, actually, I don't think it's encapsulated. So it's circumscribed. Circum in, in this one field, you see invasion? Not no. Problem. Can you get invasion if there's no capsule? In thyroid? Again, I'm trying to make a point. That's why I'm handling this. Can you get? No, it's all that. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, I can. So whether it's in, it has a capsule or it doesn't have a capsule, in the general sense, really doesn't make a difference because you're still looking for whether there's. Of course, you're not there. There's no capsule. You can't look for capsule invasion. You look for invasion into the gland or vascular invasion. So it's circumscribed, but not encapsulated. It really. It shouldn't separate out lesion types. Okay. So it's circumscribed. It's not necessarily encapsulated, and there's no invasion, as far as we can tell. All right. What about growth pattern? So this is like, uh, thank you. It looks, I'm sorry, what? Follicular pattern. What about towards the top of the field? Is that follicular? I mean, where we see the colloid, clearly it's fully different. What about where there's not colloid? Yeah. It still looks like it's making, I mean, there's, you know, you know less overt colloid, but those pink areas, this works. You know, that's colloid, that's colloid, that's colloid. What stain can you do to prove not immunized to tell you that that's probably colorful? No immunized. Nobody wants to do it, you know. Very simple stain. Anybody? 
You said? No. PAS. It'll just you know make it bright. So if you're not sure you have a cowboy forming lesion, you know, certainly you probably get a thyroglobulin, but that's gonna take you there. But there are areas of this that it's you know maybe still follicular, but less over. Okay, so it's a follicular pattern growth. What else can you say? What else should we be looking for in this lesion? So, when they're looking at the nucleus, uh, they look like Okay. They're enlarged. They're, they're elongated. The chromatin is very fine. And, excuse me? Is there some overlapping? There's some overlapping, but you know, that's all relative. This is not an inclusion. Why is that not an inclusion? It looks like an inclusion, but it's not an inclusion. It's an artifact. But what's the difference between this and and, uh, and here? And real inclusions, which generally you don't see in this lesion, but occasionally you can. So whenever you want to be sure you're dealing with the an inclusion that merits concern in the thyroid, which is the eosinophilic. These are clear. They have very sharp, because it's an invagination in the cytoplasm, it takes the nuclear membrane with it and separates, so it has sharp membranous definition. And these don't. So these, this, these are artifacts. They're clear, they lack that defining uh, membrane. So what are our issues here? What are we... What are your concerns, if not, what do you think this is? So, here I see features that could be suggested of Okay. So I'm concerned for that. I saw the thing, uh, not my diary has to go to the or What's the difference between the first diagnosis and the second diagnosis? In this case, you want to look for encapsulated. What did we start with? And, and what's the end in this case? Non invasive. Does it say encapsulated? Does it say non encapsulated? See, that's the point I was trying to make. If you're waiting for a capsule to make a diagnosis of NIFT, you miss the diagnosis. It could be circumscribed and non encapsulated. That's why that name encapsulated was not put in on diagnosis. Okay, so if this is not a NIFT and it's not fully, what would you call it? Single isolated lesion in the thyroid. Okay. So what's your diagnosis? Is there anything that can help you make the diagnosis? Did you know things help you? I mean, some people believe you can. I don't. And in this instance, I don't think so. The molecular help you. What do you think the molecular signal is for this lesion? I'll give you three choices. BRAF, red PTC, and RETS. Nice. Okay. Does that help you make a diagnosis? Let's say it's RAS compared. Well, it would remove what diagnosis? It would remove some papillaries, not all papillaries. The follicular variant of papillary carcinoma, non-invasive, is generally a RAS mutated tumor. And that's part of the rationale for the nomenclature change. So now I'm going to try to ask you, what is your diagnosis? We have three choices. Liquid adenoma, NIFT, and uh, liquid man and papillary particles. Two of those wave by to the patient and they go home. They have a good life, they don't worry about anything. The third, you buy that patient a 
completion thyroidectomy and postoperative radioactive iodine. So your diagnosis is going to drive, and that patient carries a designation of malignancy the rest of their lives. There's no pressure on it except that the family is sitting here and they're waiting for you to make your diagnosis. I'm still going to say how the nuclear Okay. So, so what do you want to diagnose it? So that I want to diagnose it. Okay. Patient's now scheduled for completion of thyroidectomy tomorrow and radiation and uh, post operative radioactive iodine next week. Everybody agree? Uh, I call it Nifpeak. You call it Nifpeak. Anybody else? This is Nifpeak. So let's get some things there. Before this was NIFP, this was follicular variant of papillary thyroid So we've got to understand that the nomenclature is confusing. Because there's a non-invasive follicular variant of papillary and there's an invasive follicular variant. The invasive follicular variant of papillary, usually it's not encapsulated, it's infiltrative, it has intralegional sclerosis, and it's DRAP in the paper. It is confusing, right? If you look at the paper published on NIFP, there is a diagram showing progression of disease from NIFP to, quote, invasive variant, follicular variant of papillary thyroid That continuation from NIFP is generally a RAS mutated, doesn't change the BRAF, and has the potential to metastasize like a follicular carcinoma. So there were people in that study who argued about when they, when they went around the table asking us what we thought we should call this new entity, and I said, you know, let's call it a follicular abnormal. Because of all kinds of purposes, that's what it is. And when it invades, it invades like a follicular carcinoma with breast mutation and metastasize preferentially not to lymph nodes. But the other one, again, confusing, same terminology, unless somebody's going to change it, and probably somebody should, is a BRAF mutated tumor that behaves like a papillary cancer with no metastasis. So scrolling back to this, as long as there's no invasion, it's Almost 100% follicular pattern, you can allow for a minimal, the paper says 1% papillary growth. We've got a real capillary with fibrovascular force. Uh, no somoma bodies, no pattern that might put it into something else over 30%, solid trabecular thing sort of. No necrosis and mitosis. And the whole lesion has been sampled, so you see the entire periphery. Then you can use the feet, patient thumb. Like a follicular animal. Okay? So, regarding encapsulation, so that's not a criteria. No, right? no. It can be encapsulated. It can or be encapsulated or circumscribed, like this one, but no invasion. So, so, remove this issue of a capsule from this general concept. Mm -hmm. It's confusing because if you look in the literature, a lot of papers publish this encapsulated follicular carcinoma. Encapsulated, you know, and, and I'm not denigrating those, but you know, it's, it, sure, capsule is fine, but if you have the criteria for malignancy, then it becomes malignant. Okay, so the first of a not so new entity, but a new name. Okay, number two. Okay, exactly. Get this one. Okay, this is a 61 year old male with a sign of nasal mass. Yeah, you looked at this before? <laughs> I looked at it yesterday. What, what was your initial diagnosis, consideration diagnostically based on what you see here? And it should always be. If you see this pattern, and I'll give you the pattern, critical form. Microcystic critical form, with basaloid nuclei. In the head and neck, and maybe other locations. Let's say I told you this was parotid gland, but it's not. This should engender an immediate consideration of what would have otherwise of what, you know? And if not, just, you know, I had a high school uh, English teacher who used to say, burn it into your brain. So burn this visual image into your brain going forward. I can tell you the diagnosis. I don't want to, what? 
I, I, what should you consider? No, but there's no squamous differentiation. We'll get back to that. Anybody? Adenoid cystic carcinoma. Okay? This Swiss cheese cribriform pack is classic, but not necessarily pathenomonic. Okay? Having said that, what one finding in this field removes it from an a, a adenoid cystic carcinoma? Just that. Adenoid cystic carcinoma. Adenoid cystic carcinomas are what kind of tumors? They arise from what, what gland? Salivary. Salivary gland. Okay. What, and this is sinonasal. Of course we have adenoid cystics in sinonasal, correct? Anywhere you have glands, minor salivary glands, you have any salivary gland tumor. Some are more common, some are less common. But what one finding in this one field should immediately exclude that diagnosis? Is there any huh? Just, just accurate. And I know, you know, actually, you know, it's probably unfair to give you this case, but life's not fair, right? <laughs> and I'll, I'll leave the arrow right on it. What's that? What is the arrow on? What's this? Well, it's something different than what? Yeah, it's something yeah, different. Specific. It's something that usually lines. Is it the is it squamous? Level? Yeah, but is squamous normal in the sinonasal tract? What's the normal lining of the sinonasal tract? What's the normal lining of the trachea? What's the normal lining of the bronchus? What's the normal lining, you know, of, of the supraglottic and subglottic larynx? I mean, I know you know this. You just, I mean, when you're, you're pushed for an, an answer, you know, sometimes it gets stuck. Huh. Well, I mean, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a respiratory epithelium with cilia, right? So if that's squamous, what, and it's normal squamous, what happened? Metaplastic. metaplastic. That's all. That's the end of the story. But this, if you go from here to here, and you see the tumor originating, what appears to be from the surface, that is one paper. And, and added to the AFIP many years ago, Gannep and Hefner, and the reason I know is because I worked with both of them, and they published a paper. Um, purporting to show salivary gland tumors arising from the surface. Maybe they do occasionally, but in generally, that's a, that's a disqualifier. So this looks like it's coming off the surface. So generally, it's not an anosquamous carcinoma. Okay, so what else can you tell me about this thing? You think, we'll put it in big terms. You think this benign malignant? Now remember, in, in for now, we'll just use salivary gland lesions of non-major glands, of minor glands. They are not encapsulated. They might be circumscribed, but they're not encapsulated. So, so fat, whether you're thinking about a capsule or no capsule it doesn't help you here. But just generally, when you look at this, it, it you think this is a benign lesion or a malignant one? And it's based on pattern. I mean, at, when you look at the growth, I mean, there's a lot of like uh, it's kind of like cellular overlap. So, but you can't tell that. It's just that this power, you know, it's not confined. Yeah. So it's, 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 it doesn't look benign. Right. Well, it's got an infiltrative pattern. Mm -hmm. So it's probably malignant. Mm -hmm. You know, we can look for perineal invasion. We can look for vascular invasion. We're probably not going to see. It. Okay. So most of this lesion is comprised of what kind of cell type? And now, you know, I see we're getting a little bit late here, so um, we'll, we'll move it a little bit, but I just wanted to, you know, define some things. Well, they're cuboidal type cells. Okay. Well, let's, what would you say about the chromatin? And, and the cells that I'm pointing It's hyperchromatic. Good. Hyperchromatic, angulated. Is there, and everything is relative. Mm -hmm. So is there mild, moderate, or marked nuclear chemomorphism? I would say it's moderate. Okay. I, well, when you, when you say that, you try to determine whether from nucleus to nucleus there's a significant change in size and shape. So, 
even if you agree with moderate, do you think that there's greater uniformity or less uniformity of the nuclei in terms of their overall size and shape? There's more uniformity. Yes. And in general, adenoid cystic carcinomas have these hyperchromatic nuclei with very little variation in size and shape. And this one has a mitotic figure, but generally it's amitotic. So the, the crib of forming, the cell type, and then where the, where the arrow is pointing looks a little bit different, right? What does it look like? Just structure-wise. It looks like a gland. Good. And it's a tubule or a gland, and it has more eosinophilic cells with so it stands out. So th this is typical for adenoid system. This combination of the blue cells, which are aboluminal, away from the lumen, or myofilial, and then the true duct lining cells. So this is another, it generally, not this tumor, but adenoid cystic, is comprised of epithelial myofilial cells, so it's pleomorphic adenoma. So is uh, polymorphous low grade, although some people argue that. Um, epithelial and myopithelial carcinoma. So there are a lot of salivary gland tumors that are made up of both epithelial and myopithelial cells, but based on stromal component, you know, configuration, pattern, we separate tumors. Okay, so we don't need to do much more here. This is all the thing. We see surface involvement. We see a really glandular looking lesion that has um, features like adenoid cystic carcinoma. I'm just looking for one last thing. It's coming off the surface. And generally, one should find this plastic changes of the surface epithelium. And we could argue that, you know, this is dysplasia, but it's not the most classic, this plastic change. So in the theme of new entities, and we could do it, you could do immunostates. But um, Anybody know what this is? It's associated with HPV 33 and 35, not 16, 18. So this is now defined as cyanonasal HPV related adenoid cyst carcinoma, HPV related carcinoma with adenoid cystic like disease. It's only associated with HPV, not 16, 18. No, at least reported so far in the, in the, in the one study by uh, Justin Bishop out of Hopkins, they found HPV on molecular 33, 35. We have one case of cyanide that they want to write up. So the overall biology, we're not sure what that is, but you know, in the theme of new lesions, this is one that uh, has recently been described. Okay. I know that it's HPV-related carcinoma with adenoid cystic-like features. Number three. Okay. Yes, the history is Okay. Pretty what? Oh, okay. Did, can you speak up because the air condition or you know, the air is making right? Listen, these are all difficult cases, all right? But, you know, um, for the last go round, I thought new entities and maybe in you know, unusual locations. So I'm not expecting, you know, a specific diagnosis, but just generally speaking, what you, you know, neoplastic, non neoplastic, benign, malignant. But if you can go further than that, then that's fine. Well, there's some vacuolated cells. There's some, you know, nondescript. So, what are you thinking? I'm not sure. I think maybe it's a possibility. Okay. 
So what do you want to do to prove that or not? And always start with the simple, if you're thinking about stains, crystal chemistry, and then immunosity. And now I can't look at stains too. Okay, but what histochemical stains do you want to do? Okay, so the amusin and uh, PSDPS shows the intraluminal material to be weakly mucin positive and DPS positive, but no intracytoplasmic cells have mucin. Since you mentioned P63, negative. So you think it's a mucopidermal carcinoma? No. But that's in the differential. So you're thinking salivary gland, right? And that's the right thought. So what else do you want to do? I'll tell you right now, these are keratin positive, but that's not going to help you. And I can tell you that this entity which is more common in other locations, has never been reported in this location. So this is a recent consult that I have that we're probably going to write up only because it's not been reported in the labs. I have a thought. You have a what? I have a thought about it. Wait, yeah, it's not your turn. Yeah, I'm memory and I love to Wait, 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 wait. So what else do you want to do? You want to send it to a consultant? <laughs> Okay, so, so since we're five chimed in, he said that he thinks this is a mammary analog secretory carcinoma. So what immunostains do you want to do? And I'll only give you three. Three stains. And don't tell me keratin. Three stains to prove that or disprove it. That's what? Which one? Gata 3 is not one of the stains, but it will be positive. Yeah. Yeah. No, so we can get a consult consultation. Yeah. That's one on grid. Right. Memoglobin. And which side? And dog one. Okay. Why the dog one? To differentiate from acidic cells. Did you see any cells with granular basic cytoplasm? Okay. okay. So the dog one is negative. S100 and mammoglobin diffusely positive. This has the ETB6 translocation we did. So this is an laryngeal mammary analog secretory carcinoma, another entity relatively recently described. In the morphology, it is that of a glandular lesion. It's got cricket forming, a little bit cystic, microcystic. I'd say more microcystic than than cricket uh, forming cells. And evacuated cells are one of the characteristic features, which is very similar to axinic cell. And then before this was defined, it was called the zymogen poor axinic cell carcinoma. Okay, what's the overall biology of that? Mm -hmm. Okay, do a neck dissection or don't do a neck dissection? Okay, that's correct. Area five, this is yours. Uh, left middle ear lesion in the 43 year old man. So, but I can see that it's a polypoid lesion and the crystal is very blue at low power, and I can see in the periphery a lot of pottery artifacts. And I was looking at the periphery of the lesion to look for any lining epithelium, so which was very attenuated at some places. At most, there is a low cuboidal. Epithelium, I could see, but mostly the surface is ulcerated. So, coming to the lesion proper, so it is cellular and it is uh, composed of this um, very monomorphic diffuse population of small cells, which many of them look like lymphocytes, but I think it's a mixed population, which is comprising some lymphocytes, histiocytes, and there are a lot of uh, large histiocytes and plasma cells as well. So there are, however, these areas which look uh, quite atypical. So there is just clusters of uh, atypical cells. Um, Let me tell you something. This is not an easy diagnosis. Um, just letting you know. But because it's unusual, I threw it in. I was confused whether I'm dealing with a benign lesion or a malignant lesion. And, and rightly so. Nothing is standing out. If you think this is malignant, what malignancy do you think? Still, I was thinking about uh, non-epithelial. Non-epithelial. Okay. Could this be an epithelial neoplasm? It can be, because at this focus, 
it looks it has a clustering and the grouping so the cells look like epithelial at this uh, magnification so there's a lot of cytoplasm in some of the cells so i would not rule that out before okay. doing any immune. so what do you want to do i would like to do at least the cytokeratin and the lymphoid markers lymphoid markers is a lot of lymphoid yeah. cells there so mm -hmm. cd45 is positive mm -hmm. cd20 is positive but and cd3 is positive do you think it's one point? No. So it's cytokratic at least. They're clustering the cells, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. It's positive. So it can be actually it's a carcinoma then. So lymphoepithelioma like carcinoma. What do you want to do? EBV, EBV. It's deeper. Mm -hmm. So, what's your diagnosis? Is it metastatic? Um, we can rule it out, but it can be primary. In the year? I haven't heard of it. <laughs> That's right. There's one case report in the world literature. But this is a, a nasopharyngeal type or lymphophilioma, lymphophilioma like. Carcinoma arising in the middle ear with no known primary in the nasal pharynx. Just remember that the opening of the middle ear, which is eustachian two, is in the lateral wall of the nasal pharynx. So, in theory, the, the lesion of the nasal pharynx could colonize and, and grow up into the, into the eustachian two and into the middle ear. But there's no history like that. Okay, so a rather unusual case. Let's move on to the next one. So, at this time of vacation, I see um, sheets of uh, two cells. And so, it, it looks like there's a little bit of some surface feeling in here. Where's this lesion located? In terms of compartment. I'm sorry? Where's this tumor growing? That's the surface to the bottom left. This is mostly located where? Oh, so okay. Think it's epithelial or not epithelial? Um, I mean, that it's kind of hard to see because it's magnification, but just. Uh, I would say non epithelial. Okay. But um, I can't be sure. Have you seen the slides before? Yes. Okay. Generally speaking, when you see a lesion growing cohesively like that, you generally should think epithelial more than anything else. Okay. On occasion, once you exclude or it excludes itself, then you think about other things. So if it's in the submucosa and it's epithelial, where do you think this is originating from in terms of normal structure? Um, the uh, inner salivary? Yeah, salivary. Okay. So in general, is this confined or non confined in terms of its growth? I would say. In other words, is it circumscribed? We're not circumscribed. <laughs> no, it's not circumscribed. So generally, when you see that combination, it's malignant. Biopsies might not include, you know, nerves or, or vascular spaces in order to make a you know determination whether it's perineural or not. So, anything else that calls your attention in terms of growth pattern? It might not be the most classic example. Set 
So if you look here, it's got a little bit of a cribriform pattern. And here you see these structures. What do they remind you of? Um, in, in non, in non, it's somewhere outside the head and neck. Right. Yeah, these are glomeruloid bodies. This is about as classic as you get. You have this epithelial lining, and then there's retraction, and this outward growth that looks like glomerular. So generally, when you see this combination, it should be diagnosed. Anybody? What's it doing in the sinus nasal tract? It can be there. Really? It's great. But who? <laughs> it, it's, we haven't reported these yet, but with one, we have a, we presented these. So it's not we've been reporting in the sinus nasal tract. Uh, these are thought to be related to polymorphous low grade animal carcinomas. Uh, but they're considered at least by some different. Yeah, we have some MC species in the dominant. That's true, too. Yeah, but generally the oral cavity, if you describe the major right. glands. Yeah. And then my point is we have minor salivary glands. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sticking all the way down to the yeah, minor. Yeah, anywhere, right. But I don't think they've been moving forward in the long year. Yeah. Maybe they have. So, you know how these behave? Uh, and what makes them different than polymorphous low grade animal carcinoma? They often present with metastatic disease. So generally, if you make this diagnosis, and our clinical colleagues are not familiar with it, you know, they get asked you what to do, and you know, of course they tend to metastasize and come to work it up for metastatic disease. Okay. We have about 15 minutes left. So this is a 65-year-old female with a nasal tract Russian. Yes. So on the lower power, um, seems like polyphoric structures. Okay. Lined by um, epithelium, which doesn't strike me as malignant. Um, and then those, uh, the matrix is closed and it has a lot of so what do you think is going on? I think it's, um, it's a hematoma of some sort. <laughs> a hematoma of some sort. Why is it not a neoplasm? Stealth? Um, probably I can't see the features of what I've seen before. The nuclear, not I'm not going to show you the nuclear features. What about this? Should separate it out from a true glandular neoplasm. If this is a hemorrhoid home, just at this magnification, what would you expect in an adenoma, which is not that common? And the most common, this is the most common adenoma in the cytonasal tract. Anybody? What's the most common adenoma in major salivary glands? Same thing in the cytonasal tract. You think this is a pleomorphic adenoma? I think it's a monomorphic animal. Yeah. So generally speaking, the differentials are with an adenocarcinoma. And what about this contrast with an adenocarcinoma? Just the dysmagnification. Yes, there are many glands. There are mucin cells lining. Now they're really bland. You can get malignancies that kind of have that feature. But what about here differentiates it from something like a low-grade adenocarcinoma? It is the Density. It's like looking in the endometrium and trying to separate out hypoplasia from adenocarcinoma. Here, the glands are somewhat separated, and they're separated by, as we go to higher magnification, residual serum mucus glands, fibroconnective tissue. They're not densely packed back to back. And you can see that whatever this is is similar to this, which is coming off the surface in. Vaginating ground. So this immediately we've seen a few is is a hematoma. Which kind of hematoma? 
for the respiratory epithelial laboratory. Good, that's what it is. What other glandular hematoma occurs in this location? Anybody? Serumucin is hematoma, and there may be overlapping features, or they may be separate. But we've got higher magnification, but this is all you need to look at. And you may see it like the presenting patients present with these lesions, or you may find a focal area in, in you know, these curettings of the cytonasal tract. What about the band that highlight around the gland that the books talk about? I didn't see it. Oh, those? Okay. Yeah, they're, they're highlight bands. Right? Okay. But there's also atrophic changes. So you can get, and right here, you can see that the glands are separated by serumucins. Normal. You will never see that in animal carcinoma. And not every case is as straightforward as this, but this is pretty close. Okay. We have 10 minutes. This is uh, uh, 39 female with cyanose. Okay. And the suffer like cystic, but when it's like single layer of cells, right? And the cells that must be a clarity, but nuclei is like um, to it. So, what is characteristic about the cell? Uh, they're clear cells, they're clear cells, right? Yeah. So, what, what are we thinking? About? And what else do you see in the center? You see red cells, yeah. we'll come back to that. So, what are what are your considerations here? It's only because you can't wait. Why the lymphatic features and systems have actually two additional results? Well, I was thinking that it is not the year of lymphatic sac, you know, because endolymphatic sac. But you know what? It looks very much like that. Yeah. So when you think of endolymphatic sac, what should you want to know about the patient? History. What history? Like Specifically. The patient had the ear lesion. Okay. Aside from the ear lesion, usually some syndrome. Oh, well, like. Um, Something like the ear panels, hearing loss, or something. The ATL. One hip open. Oh, which? Image of last one was an overpass at chapter 11 tumor. Pancreatic and persistent panel. So I don't know that that history exists in this patient, but it looks like in the lymphatic sac chapter 11 tumor. But anybody know what this is? I think I, I don't have this uh, cyanidal renal cell like in the first one. Pretty rare. I've, this is my one case that I have, but it's reported in the literature. But you have to rule out metastasis because we don't sell cancers can metastasize that we don't have the history, or that it's in a cult primary. And how would we do that? We can do um, Pax-8. Okay. Generally, these are Pax-8, I think CD10, and renal cell carcinoma. Another pretty rare, unusual case. Okay. We'll just open this up for anybody. This is number eight. This is my label. Well, 35 is the sign of an It's a. Uh, Not you. <laughs> okay, what's the dominant feature here? Spindle. Okay. And. And uh, anything else that you see where the arrow is? What is that? And these are characteristic features. I mean, this has been defined, you know, this was originally called something else, but now we recognize it for what it is. So the spindle lesion is there. Uh, do you think it's benign or malignant? It's rather bland, right? Yeah. And I don't have this one example doesn't have clear cut evidence of an invasion, but it's typically invade bone. So they are they are malignant. What kind of stains would you want to get to? What do they look like in terms of just the cell plane? 
but pretty squiggly, right? And that often, that, that wavy, buckled appearance goes along with what general tumor type? Neural, right? So what stain do you want to do to try to prove that? Okay. No SOX 10. Both can be positive. Anything else? Stat 6. Stat 6. Usually negative. But this can all also mark for muscle markers. This was originally called a, a low-grade malignant schwannoma or fibrosarcoma. But we now recognize it. And the glandular component, you know, may or may not be a significant player, but it is the spindle component often, you know, goes along with this glandular hyperplasia. But this is a low-grade sinonasal sarcoma with neural and myogenic differential features. Okay, it's another rather unusual case. The last two are not, well, maybe this one is unusual. Yes. Yeah. Generally low grade, but it's it's malignant because it's generally infiltrative. But but excision usually is curative. Yes, yeah, biphasic uh, phenotypic cytomasis or something. Right, that's another name. Okay, this is a lip bleed, a minor malignant. Malignant. And what's classic about the feet? <coughs> Cribiform, <coughs> cystic, mm -hmm. haploid. So it's on the lip. You have a diagnosis? We just put that together. But and it's still the polymorphism. Excuse me? And it's still the polymorphism. Polymorphous low grade? Usually not ever papillary like this. And those polymorphous low grades that were defined as having a significant papillary component and, and, and more often the test that was reported at in the Anderson are probably the cripple format of carcinoma. So generally polymorphous low grade doesn't look like that. Mask, no. Mask doesn't really have this kind of cell type. You saw the last it's more of a bubbly, vacuolated cell with glandular. This is cystic papillary um, improvement. And there is a distinct entity, but before you make that diagnosis, salivary cup cancer needs to be excluded. So what one stain would you want to do to exclude salivary cup? The androgen receptor. It's negative. So once you just remove that, this is a cystic, cystadenal carcinoma, papillary cystadenal. Okay, the very last case is a parathyroid, which is not that uncommon. Okay, how would you define infiltration? Are you sure it's definitely missing? So here's a vessel in the lower area, and there's no tumor in it. I think there's some, um, once you see a vessel, it's probably some nerve tumor. Right? So the way I try to define invasion is the vascular invasion, a perineural invasion. So I would get an S100 on this, and, it's any, and uh, invasion into any identifiable structure like thyroid. So there's there's none of that. But what are the features that worry you from malignancy? There? No, but there's no infiltration. You can't absolutely define that there's infiltration. It might look like it, but unless you see it around nerves or in a blood vessel or in thyroid, then you can't say it's malignant. But what about features worry you histologically for the possibility of malignancy? It includes these fibrous bands, oh, yeah. That's right? A little bit of trabecular growth pattern. Mm -hmm. There's no cytologic atrophy, there are no mitosis. So, how are we going to handle something like this in the last minute? Is your parathyroid? 
your case. Right. Can you call this paraphyre or personal? That's my initial thought. Because the problem is not the initial, but there's no solution that's No, no other lesions. This is the only enlarged gland. The, the preoperative levels of serum calcium parathyroid came down intraoperatively once this was removed and has stayed stable, low baseline, postoperative. So it's either an adenoma or it's a carcinoma. There's no hyperplasia because it's only one blood. I would say I didn't know what we had typical features. I don't know what the typical features. What's atypical about it? This uh, band lace. <laughs> yeah, this is an adenoma with atypical features. Because they have features worrisome for malignancy, but not quite malignant. Okay, maybe not the greatest cases. That's what I have available. So uh, we're done. Any questions? Okay. Thank you.